so as I said, welcome to our annual forum on basic income 2020. And this forum is happening at a very, uh, it feels like a very particular time, uh, uh, exactly the right time. And we have a, one of our main aims of this forum is to really look at this um, new pilot on basic income that has uh, come into the program for government. And uh, our concern is really that that is a pilot for implementation. And we want to be able to explore that today. We have some incredible keynote speakers to share their wisdom to guide us. We want to hear from you. We would like you to discuss and uh, learn from and exchange with each other and give us a chance to really grapple with this. How, how could this pilot work? How can we influence that it really is something that is about implementation uh, rather than perhaps uh, something that leaves basic income a bit further off into the future from actually being a reality? Um, and then set, there is a second purpose for us gathering, which is just to actually have the feeling of connecting here together as people who are passionate about this theme, have been working on it for years or maybe new to it, to gather as a network, as a set of members, as people interested in and uh, committed to basic income. And so that's our second wish as the organizers and myself as a facilitator, that you find this uh, an engaging event, that it's, uh, you feel a sense of connection, meeting others, and that we frankly just celebrate the year, a year that has been very hard, I would say, and that, that, that we can actually come here together today and we can connect to a similar mission and we can enjoy that. So that's uh, what our wish was for this event. Um, just to give you a sense of uh, the flow of the day. Um, so let me just um, get a little note of that so I can uh, share that with you. Yeah, so the flow, the flow of, well, of our afternoon. Um, uh, my colleague Anne Ryan, one of the leaders of Basic Income Ireland, is going to sort of kick us off with what is basic income really? Like a real overview of it. Some of us, like me, are um, very new to it and, and uh, along with the long standing folks. So I think you'll um, probably new and old will find that very interesting and is a kind of very appropriate opening to really hear from Anne right at the outset and also what it is at this time and in this very week, uh, as Anne will point to. Uh, then we are going to go into our keynote speeches, which uh, that panel will be hosted by John Baker. Um, and uh, he will say more about uh, our amazing speakers and you'll hear much more about that next. Um, and then we want to go into having small group conversations and I will attempt to mastermind that in the online space and hopefully that's all gonna work. Um, and uh, we'll have that, hopefully have time for a little bit of a, a short break. And then we will move into an open floor and we really want to hear from you and what, what you have to say, what was coming up in those conversations. Um, we are then really delighted to have two key responders uh, on behalf of us here in Ireland to responding to what they've heard from the keynote speeches from, from all of you. Um, and John will again introduce that um, and introduce those responders uh, shortly. Um, and then we'll hear some final remarks from, from our dear speakers. And then as uh, we will hand over to Bobby Lambert, um, the final one of our coordinators, um, who will sort of say, well, what next? Where do we go next? Uh, and uh, Bobby maybe mentioned a few of you, we do have a bit of a, we would, we would like to invite you to, to maybe stay around at the end if you would like. Uh, you you don't, don't feel you need to rush off and we'll say more about our idea around that at the end. But uh, we will be formally ending the event at 4.30. Um, so with that, I think that's everything I wanted to say to just set the intentions for the event, give you an overview of the flow. Um, and um, with that, I think this is the right moment for me to um, hand over to Anne and invite her to open up with really setting the scene and guiding us on what basic, basic income actually is. So Anne, if I could bring you up now. And Anne, just to say you'll need to unmute. Hello, everyone. And uh, sorry for uh, stop it was being muted at the start. Um, uh, just welcome to everyone. Uh, it, this is, uh, it's really great to be able to, um, to uh, be here with so many people. I mean, our, our forum has been uh, ongoing for several years. We have an annual forum and, and this is a great way that we can do it now, even though we can't be in the room together. Um, so our purpose at the beginning of every monthly meeting and indeed at the beginning of every forum that we have, we make 
um, a short presentation about what basic income is and where we think we could, how we think we could be introduced in Ireland at the moment. There's, we have a great diversity among our members and there's no real solid, hard party line um, there's, because there's such a diversity of thinking. But those of us who have been working closely together for a decade now and who have managed to get some media attention and so on, um, we do tend to emphasize the same kind of things. And that's what I would go through in this very brief presentation, which is really just um, a, a kind of a focusing device. And I suppose also it's important to refer to the, we are going to have a pilot in Ireland, it's in the programme for government, and this week the, um, the Task Force on Recovery and Culture and the Arts actually made a proposal to Minister Catherine Martin and through her to the, the Cabinet that a pilot should, um, should be a, an artist's basic income. So we're really hoping that today will feed into all of that, that discussion. Um, one of the things that has struck me uh, well, when we speak to people in general, and even during this week, listening to some of the discussions in the media about basic income, is that very that there's quite a lot of misunderstanding out there about what it actually is. So we always start with the very basics, really, and we ask people to imagine a world or a scenario where every individual gets a payment from the state that's automatic with no signing on. So it's in effect, it's universal. Uh, there's no means testing. Uh, nobody looks at your affairs, your financial affairs, before the payment is made. But in effect, mood, means testing is moved from the welfare to the tax office because you can have other income over and above your basic income. And uh, the revenue commissioners will scrutinise that and uh, you would pay an appropriate amount of tax. But nobody falls through the cracks because every payment is automatic to everyone with, without means testing. It's completely unconditional. There is no work requirement or any other conditions attached. That's an essential feature of basic income. The amount always remains the same. That's achieved by keeping it tax free or if it's in the tax system, taxing it at zero percent. And it should be enough for a frugal but decent lifestyle. So all that adds up to a basic income. Now, sometimes uh, people get a bit anxious at this stage and they say, well, I'm getting extra payments from the state. Uh, if I was getting just my basic income, I'd be worse off. So it's important to say that for people with additional needs, such as disabilities, caring needs and so on, there would be extra payments in place as we have at present. There would be payments for special issues such as housing and, of course, for emergencies such as COVID or other things that we probably can't um, envisage at the moment. So nobody on state payments would be worse off financially than they are at present in a basic income system. But we try to emphasize some of the things that basic income fixes. Uh, it fixes a lot of the faults and gaps in the current social welfare system, highlighted indeed by COVID, but which have been there for a long time, where there are sometimes people have no entitlements to payment. Uh, there might be delays in their payments um, uh, or there are pover the poverty trap whereby people, if they take up low paid work, are, are, are worse off um, in the current social welfare system. And it also, basic income also addresses the income gap in proposal for universal basic services, which many of you will know about. Universe, you, we believe that universal basic services without a basic income leaves people with insufficient choice about how to use their time and energy. A certain amount of cash is necessary along with really good public services. Now, all of you here could probably give me, on any of us, a huge list of reasons why you might want to have a basic in income, but the ones we emphasize are that it supports a caring society, it supports a modern, flexible economy, always has done, but particularly in this time of transition concerning ecology and climate and, and COVID, and it also supports quality of life for everyone, dignity, freedom to say yes, freedom to say no, control over one's affairs. Um, by itself, basic income won't produce those outcomes, but it is one of the necessary elements. It must, of course, be accompanied by a good social wage and a suite of public services. At this point, when we're talking to people, they're often thinking, hmm, basic income sounds like a good idea, but surely we could never afford it. And what we find is that people start talking about all sorts of things like extra environment and resource taxes, rents from land and site values, dividends from the wealth that we all create together collectively, financial transactions taxes, other wealth taxes, 
and of course a debt free money system. All are fantastic ideas and within our basic income Ireland there's lots of interest in those but they're not well enough developed at the moment to to support a basic income. What people often don't realize is that we could with the current tax and welfare system start now with a basic income. We could have a partial introductory basic income right now if the will was there. So that would be fund that we would call that a partial basic income. It would be pegged at existing social welfare rates. So child benefit would remain the same. Uh, people between 18 and 65 would get the same as job seekers allowance and uh, people over 65 would get the same as the state pension. It's one possible model, it's credible and it's doable now. The way it would work is that um, you would replace most tax credits with basic income. You would replace the core social welfare payments, job seekers allowance and um, sickness benefit with a basic income and you would need, need to make adjustments to the tax on other income to the equivalent of a 48% flat rate or two rates of 30 and 60%. And here we draw on work done by Social Justice Ireland and we're very grateful to the work they have done over the years on all of this matter. And I know some of them are here today. This is just one model. We're not completely wedded to it, uh, but it's, an, it's important that we're able to say this could be done now and that it's, it's doable and credible. We emphasize other points also when we're talking about basic income, that even this partial basic income brings significant benefits because it's universal, conditional and permanent. And there are re three really, really key features of basic income. Everyone would have it, no conditions attached, and it's from cradle to grave. We also, of course, continue to advocate for a full basic income and to explore other sources of funding, such as the ones I mentioned earlier, for the longer term. We emphasize too, oh, I seem to have, yeah, oh, there's some qualifications that we take care to mention then are that it's not enough to have it in just one country, there is a need for a global basic income. We point out, and this is very important, that regressive proposals exist for basic income, which would provide a basic income but take away other state supports and services. And I think if we have a party line on anything, it's that, that we don't support such, such proposals. So there's loads more that I could say to quote one of my favorite country singers, Lyle Lovett, there's more I could mention, but our main uh, event today is to hear from our speakers, Evelyn, Jurgen, and Wendy initially. Uh, we're hoping to have a comment from someone from the Arts and Culture Task Force if she's here to reflect on that very recent development this week. And then we have our commentators, Helen and Sean, and their brief is to look at how a pilot in Ireland could be a stepping stone to a full permanent universal basic income. So I've galloped through that, uh, but we felt it's important to set that at the start. And I'm going to hand back now to Ali. Great, thank you, Anne. Um, and I will just... Uh had myself here. Thank you. Well, uh, certainly to have to actually get the full introduction to that, that was um, certainly many things that I felt I needed to know. And I hope that was really useful for everyone else as well. So I will just um, uh, invite now um, Anne's colleague, John Baker, to, um, to come up to the front. And I'll just see if you're there, I'm John. Here, yeah. um, great. <coughs> and um, let's see. Oh, here we are. Yeah. And um, John is going to take us into our next section of the forum, which Anne has already alluded to, which is our keynote speakers. Um, so I won't say any more than that. Over to you, John. Great. Well, you're all very, very, very welcome today. Um, we have three brilliant keynote speakers from all over the world. Um, Evelyn Forger, Wendy Harty, and Jürgen Vispolara. Um, so I'll just introduce each of them in turn. Uh, our first speaker is Evelyn Forger. Evelyn's actually one of the heroes of the basic income movement on account of her groundbreaking work on the Manitoba minimum income experiment that was conducted in the 1970s. The mothballed data from that was neglected until she analyzed it about 10 years ago and came up with some brilliant results. Uh, more recently, I found her talk on the about the Ontario pilot at the 1980s, the 2018 Vienna Congress, inspiring, passionate, and informative. And I'm delighted to welcome her here. So over to you, Evelyn. 
Thank you, John. That's a, a very intimidating kind of an introduction to begin with. Um, it's a lovely morning here in Winnipeg. I'm joining you from Canada. And what I thought I'd do this morning is to talk a little bit about the two projects, the two pilot projects we've tried to run in Canada. And I'm delighted to be here because I know this is a really exciting time in Ireland as you think about this new pilot project that's going to go forward. And what I'm going to say is in the nature of a cautionary tale, because what I'm going to do is to tell you about some of the things that went wrong, some of the things that didn't work as well as we'd like to have worked in Canada. Um, you shouldn't take that as a negative thing. I think a pilot is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to move forward and to move the whole project of basic income forward, which I think is essential and inevitable in this world. So as John said, we experimented with basic income twice in Canada, um, once in the 1970s in a project called MINCOM, and once more recently, it began in 2017 and ended um, very ignominiously in 2018, and I'll tell you what happened with that experiment. And I want to leave you with two takeaway points, and I'm going to mention them up front just in case I start telling stories and run out of time. I think if you begin to operate a pilot, it's very, very, very important that you make sure that everybody, everybody on the research team, your research sponsors, the research participants, everybody has to know before you begin what the purpose of your pilot is. And they have to know how you'd know if the pilot was successful. That may seem obvious, um, but it's really important because it influences the way you design the pilot how you communicate the results, what kind of data you collect, and, and a thousand other things about the pilot. As I said, it may seem obvious, but in the event, in practice, it turns out to be much, much more challenging than you might think, particularly if your pilot team consists of academic researchers and civil servants and political staff and all kinds of people, which leads to my second takeaway point. Understand that political staff and civil servants and academic researchers and activists and pilot participants all bring very different sets of values to the exercise. They, I don't mean ideological values. They may all agree on the importance of basic income and the basic presumptions of, of the pilot, but they bring very, very different understandings about the role that research plays in policymaking and about the role of, about how policymaking works in society. So it, they bring different understandings about things like whether you can or ought to respond to changing circumstances in the middle of your pilot. So you've got this pilot up and running, something dramatic happens like COVID-19, what do you do? Um, they bring different understandings about um, who gets to make what kind of decisions and how much authority they have to make those decisions, what kind of discretion they have. Who controls the budget? Um, and most importantly at all, who gets to say what to whom and when? Who gets, it, it isn't helpful to researchers if the minister's talking to the press in the middle of the project. Um, it's equally not helpful to politicians if researchers are talking to the press in the middle of a sensitive political period. So all of those things have to be understood upfront before you begin your project. So with that in mind, I'll tell you how we didn't do those things in Canada and what the consequences were. Uh, MINCOM. MINCOM project was a very large scale project that took place in the mid 1970s. And it delivered a form of basic income to families for a period of three years. And it had a very clear purpose at the outset. At the time, people were worried that if you introduced a basic income, people would stop working. They would work less. So they wanted to know what the impact would be on the labor market. Um, it was set up in a, in a way that worked really quite well. Um, an arm's length organization was developed to run this project. They hired people, they collected data, they recruited participants, and they gathered the data. The, the experiment continued for the full planned period of time. There was no difficulty with that. Um, the data was collected. Remember, this was the 1970s. It was collected on paper, in boxes, in file cabinets. Um, and, and the way that people collected data in the 1970s. People stopped receiving money as planned at the end of the experiment, and they were left with 1,800 boxes full of data, and um, they'd run out of money at that point. And so they went back to the government. This was um, partially funded by the provincial government and partially funded by the federal government. 
They went back to both levels of government in 1978 and said, we have 1800 cubic feet of data to analyze. We'd like some money to do that, please, so we can tell you what happened. Um, the provincial government had changed. Um, this was a special project of the social democratic government that brought it in. The new conservative government was less interested in the results. The federal government was a minority government. It was sort of hanging on by, its, by a thread and um, political events had changed dramatically in that three year period. So this wasn't a priority anymore. So the research staff was told to archive the data um, for future research and then they were all fired. And the data sat in those boxes for a very long time. Um, okay, that was one experiment. Um, make sure you've got the money to finish the project before you begin. Um, but let me talk about the Ontario experiment because it was much more recent and I was much more directly involved in the delivery of that project. So 40 years later, Ontario, the province of Ontario, which is the largest province in Canada, it has about 40% of the population. And they decided to run a large scale pilot. And I should say that the form of basic income they tested was a little bit different than, than um, what was just explained to us. They tested an income tested benefit. Okay, so the money was um, the money that a family received depended on the amount of other income they had. It was income tested. It was seen as a replacement for basic welfare payments, but it was also a top up for low waged working people. Um, the impetus came from the provincial government and the purpose, the stated purpose was to find out whether basic income would reduce the depth and breadth of poverty and what the social implications of that might be. This government conducted a large number of public consultations and the public consultations had both a political and a scientific component. So they talked to academic researchers, they talked to members of the public, they talked to people with lived experience, they talked to frontline service providers, they talked to everybody. And everybody weighed in on what this pilot should be looking should look like. Now, I said it had both a political and a scientific purpose. The scientific purpose, I think, is fairly obvious. Everybody in society would benefit from a basic income, so everybody in society should have a role in saying what the basic income should look like. Um, the political purpose, though, um, was because this government was in the last year of its mandate, and it was very important for this government to shore up its left flank, so to speak, um, to demonstrate to people that they cared deeply about poverty, which had been growing in the province. And so these were very um, visible public consultations. They at the same time were talking to academic experts and um, they decided that they were going to run a pilot and they were gonna conduct it by um, choosing three regions of the province. So they chose a large urban center they chose a, a slightly smaller city in the northern part of the province where the economy is based on resource extraction. And the third area was um, a smaller town in the industrial heartland of the province where um, a lot of people had lost jobs because of the decline of manufacturing in recent years. And they were going to run two different kinds of experiments. This was on the basis of advice from the academic advisory team. And they were going to run a randomized controlled trial in the two cities, the northern town and the urban center. And a randomized controlled trial means that researchers go into town, they choose a small portion of the population, choose a certain number of people to participate, and they allocate half of them to the treatment group that gets the basic income, and the other half becomes a control group, and they, they um, subsist on whatever payments they're entitled to receive. And the idea is that at the end of the experiment, you compare results to see what happens. The third site in the industrial heartland was set up as a, a universal system. So the number of participants was large enough that it actually included everybody who on the basis of their income would be qualified for payments. So there was no control group there. And that was a slightly different design. And the idea was that these two types of experiments would generate different kinds of research and would generate some very good data for analysis going forward. Um, so they decided, the government decided to go ahead with the project, and they made, I think, the very good decision that they didn't want to hand this over to one of the large consulting firms. They wanted academics to be involved in the analysis. Now, here we ran into the first, um, the first um, impediment 
it turns out that it's very difficult to contract with the government. It takes a long time. And the lawyers on everybody's side are involved. And in the event, it took about six months to sign the contract with the academic researchers. Um, in order to protect the process, they stopped talking to everybody who had been advising them because they all might be bidders on the contract. So they stopped talking to the academics. They stopped talking to the researchers and decided to begin this project because they really wanted to get it underway on their own. And they hired a consultant to help them out. And that caused a certain amount of trouble. The government was in the last year of its mandate. So they wanted to roll this project out quickly. They wanted to make sure people were receiving checks. And um, this consultant began the project. So here's the question he began with, how do you select your sample? In a perfect world, um, in a perfect world, um, they would, they would, uh, um, they would look at a list. They would find a list. Turns out we don't have a list in Canada of people identified by their income. And it also turns out that in Canada, this kind of research requires free and fully informed consent. Um, what that means is that they called in the lawyers again in order to establish the consent project. They developed a 40 page brochure. They put it in big white envelopes and they mailed it out to participants in particular regions of these cities that were identified as low income and invited them to apply. Um, I don't know how you react when you receive a great big envelope from the government with the logo of the provincial government in the corner, but many people binned it immediately and other people opened it up and saw a 40 page brochure and binned it at that point. So they didn't get a lot of response. Um, the government kind of desperate at this point. And um, so they started, um, they started sending out invitations. It, it caused a lot of difficulty when they tried to recruit people. Um, Well, let me leave some of the difficulties out. But they got kind of desperate at this point and they decided to, um, to go and hold, hold open town halls in order to invite people to apply. And that causes all kinds of difficulty. Anyway, about six months into the process, they'd finally um, signed the contract with our research team and we took over and discovered the trouble they were in. They'd only managed to recruit about 200 people of the 6,000 they needed to participate in this experiment. And so we took over the process. We started to recruit people by working with on the ground partners. So food banks, uh, legal, legal aid clinics, um, healthcare clinics, and so on. And we managed within, by April, 2018, we had the full slate of 6,000 people. We'd done the balance test. It was a really nice sample. We were ready to go. April, we were ready to go. May, there was an election. The premier made two decisions. His first decision was to reduce the price of beer. The second decision was to cancel the pilot. He announced um, that the pilot was being canceled because it was clearly not working, um, although no data had been collected at that point. And the research team was forbidden to speak to the press. So the entire project fell apart at this time because of the change in government. And I could go on. There were a thousand other things that happened during that particular period, but I'm just going to end because I've used all of my time here. But I want to go back to my initial point. And that is that pilots aren't as easy as they seem. And the practical implementation difficulties are really, really important to keep in mind up front. And in particular, there is a huge gap between the way academic researchers work and the way political staff work. And civil servants sit somewhere in between. And it's really, really, really important to get that timeline down and to get control of the experiment, to get the administration of the experiment clear up front. And I'm going to stop there before I take somebody else's time. So thank you very much for that opportunity. Thanks, Evelyn. That, that was really fantastic. Um, very interesting. So um, pray, I, I will go straight on to our next speaker, shall I? Um, our next speaker is Wendy Harty. Now, Wendy was the project manager for a really interesting and well thought through feasibility study for an ambitious basic income pilot project in Scotland. Now, this was a, a huge exercise involving cooperation with loads of stakeholders, organizing research and analysis, and communicating everything to a wide audience. So you can imagine the tact and skill involved in bringing that all together. 
and Wendy's work has helped to drive basic income to the top of political discourse in Scotland. So I'm really pleased that she's speaking today. So over to you, Wendy. Okay, thank you so much, John. Um, can I just make sure that you can hear me okay? Maybe Ali, you can give me a nod if, if yes. everyone can hear me. I hear you really well. Perfect, that's grand. Um, so thank you so much. I'm really pleased to, to be here speaking to everyone in Ireland today. It feels like a huge, um, I think um, Evelyn mentioned uh, being intimidated. Imagine um, following Evelyn Forgey in a talk about basic income now, that's, that's intimidation <laughs> for you. Um, so Evelyn had just um, finished up our talk there just about um, the difference between academic researchers and policymakers and politicians on the other on the other end. I'm neither. I'm one of those people that falls in the middle, um, trying to occupy that space between um, between translating evidence and trying to influence policy and practice. Um, and my day job is in public health, which is a really comfortable place to be just now, as you can imagine. But indeed, for the last couple of years, I've been project managing the um, Scottish feasibility study. Um, I guess what differentiates the Scottish experience from what you've heard from Evelyn already in Canada and what you're going to hear um, from Jürgen is that in Scotland we haven't undertaken a basic income pilot and, and at the moment we don't actually have concrete plans to undertake a pilot despite what's reported in the press um, from time to time. Um, so I thought it would be useful just to give a bit of background to the work that we have done in Scotland and where we are and some of the lessons that might be helpful for Ireland and some of our other um, colleagues in basic income. So back in May 2018, it was in the programme for Scottish Government to explore the concept of basic income, um, not necessarily to undertake a pilot. And at that point, funding was made available and the funding was awarded to a collaboration that involved, that, that really um, came from local government to start with. So it was a collaboration of four local authorities in Scotland. Uh, supported by public health um, from the NHS, Scottish Government and another support organisation called the Improvement Service. And um, we were tasked to carry out a feasibility study. Now that comprised a number of strands. We did look at the published evidence that was out there already. We um, engaged with relevant organisations across the UK um, and Scottish Government, including Department for Work and Pensions and Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, which actually proved very uh, critical relationships in the work that we did. We looked at um, national and inter international surveys of public attitudes, and we did some local community engagement in the local authorities where we thought we might base the pilots, uh, certainly the local authorities that were involved in the work. Crucially, we also commissioned two new pieces of research where we felt there were really quite big gaps in our knowledge and understanding. The first one was a review of how a basic income might interact with our current benefits and social security systems within Scotland, which is a very complex um, system that's been sort of grown over a number of years with various tweaks and iterations, so it's incredibly complicated. And we also commissioned some economic modelling to look at what the wider economic impacts might be in Scotland, where a basic income rolled out. And they, they proved um, really interesting and, and very helpful in, in our work. I can just speed up a little bit. I'm afraid that I'll, I'll run out of um, time. So there were several aspects of feasibility that we wanted to look at. And the first one, and probably the most important one from speaking to our colleagues that had already um, undertaken um, pilots at that point was political feasibility. Um, Jürgen and colleagues very helpfully had already published a framework on how to fully assess um, political feasibility. So we looked at those different domains of, of strategic feasibility, the institutional context, psychological and behavioural domains, and certainly particularly institutional feasibility aspects proved to be very, very important in Scotland. On top of that, we were also interested in exploring some of the more practical issues around developing and implementing a pilot. So issues such as financial feasibility, how the pilot might be evaluated, and also quite critically, um, some of the ethical considerations around running a pilot, you know, where you're choosing to have um, one particular group or one geographical area receiving, uh, you know, a, a beneficial intervention when the rest of the population aren't. So it's, it was a really interesting exercise going through that. I think 
Just thinking back to, to looking at how we might influence policy, I think in order to have a really persuasive policy argument, it helps to have a very clear rationale for why you want to pilot. I know that Evelyn had already mentioned that. And while there's been considerable interest recently in really rapid growth in political and public interest, um, I think um, there's kind of growing interest in our response to a number of different concerns. And certainly in Scotland, it was the same. So we were interested in looking at how do we promote social justice and equality? How do we alleviate poverty and reduce income inequality? Could basic income be um, a policy that would reduce disincentives to work as opposed to, you know, some people argue that it actually would um, cause people to remove themselves from the labour market, but also potentially to address job insecurity and, and to increase people's freedom to make choices. So despite lots of really um, interesting research and some very, um, I guess, intriguing findings, particularly from some of the earlier experiments in Canada, there remained quite significant um, uncertainty around how it would work in Scotland that made policymakers quite rightly ask, ask us some very difficult questions. And I think the outstanding questions were around how would it fit with our current social security arrangements within a pilot context if we were taking some people out of the social security system and putting them into a pilot scenario, how would we make that work? Um, they were still, they remain concerned about potential labour market withdrawal. And also that a more a broader question around would it divert funds from those most in need or risk removal of other social assistance programmes. Now, clearly within the collaboration, we were very clear in the position that a basic income could not be an alternative to all the other social assistance programmes that, that we need to be part of a tranche of policy um, responses to, to poverty, etc. Something else that we considered um, in our feasibility study was actually alternatives to a pilot. It, was there some way of, of moving the agenda forward without looking at, without running a full scale pilot? And we did consider, would it be possible to move straight to policy implementation? And I think it was immediately thought of a, a very risky uh, move without implementation testing and generating more evidence within the Scottish context. We also considered doing economic modelling only, but again, given the potential range of outcomes that a basic income could generate, we felt that that would provide very incomplete evidence about those broad range of possible impacts. So, so quite firmly, the collaboration were in favour of exploring how we might um, do a pilot in Scotland. So it was crucial that in order that the proposed pilot would provide the evidence that was important for policymakers, um, that it must be designed and evaluated in a way to generate um, and measure those outcomes that were of interest to government, the very people that would be making a decision post pilot. So we decided that the pilot would aim to understand the impact of a basic income on poverty outcomes, child poverty, unemployment, health and financial well-being, and also the experience of the social security system. So we had to be able to design a pilot that would generate impact and that we'd be able to measure those impacts across all of those domains. And it was hoped that a robust pilot and evaluation would deliver improved evidence of the impact of the basic income, both on a person's or individual and family uh, household behaviours within Scotland, but also about the impacts on a community level outcome on community level outcomes. And that really um, led us down a particular path in terms of pilot design and implement, uh, sorry, evaluation design as well. So we, we didn't want to do a random sample of the whole Scottish population. We were looking at doing geographically bounded universal um, provision within a, a particular area. And overall, we hope this would stimulate policy debate on basic income, both within Scotland, the UK and, and beyond. But crucially, we wanted to design a pilot that tested all of the fundamental features of a basic income in that, um, that it met all of those basic income principles, that it was universal payments, they were unconditional, individual, regular and in cash. Um, so we started out that design phase with that in mind, that, that, that basic start that we wanted to meet all of those design principles. 
and only would make concessions when we um, met legislative or practical barriers that were insurmountable. So hoping that we would find a path towards a feasible yet robust pilot. Um, we'll now talk about where that path led us. And I think from my face, you're probably getting an idea of where it led us. So overall, we concluded that whilst a pilot in Scotland would be desirable and would be possible, there were a huge number of feasibility challenges that made a pilot incredibly difficult in the current context. Firstly, across Scotland and the UK political spectrum, there are very divergent views on basic income and preferred models. And whilst the, the published evidence suggested that basic income could impact on a broad range of social employment and health outcomes, there still remain significant questions about implementation issues. We also found that public support for basic income varied and, and whilst there was probably net support overall for the policy, there was significant variation within pop, uh, population groups dependent on employment status, age, income level, etc. Absolutely crucially, and this is the, the biggest challenge we had, there were substantive and complex legislative, technical and delivery challenges that were associated with the institutional arrangements for a pilot to be able to adequately test all principles of CBI. And that really led us to the conclusion that the Scottish Government or local authorities within, Scottish, uh, within Scotland couldn't implement a pilot of CBI alone. So what does that mean for Scotland where we are just now? Um, the primary legislation and regulation changes that would be required to run a pilot would be very complex, time consuming and costly. And full collaboration of UK government, particularly within the Department of Work and Pensions and HMRC would be required to understand and overcome these challenges to run a pilot. Reducing the scale or the scope of a pilot or amending the pilot design could potentially reduce some of the barriers, but would not provide a true test of a universal unconditional basic income. And political will and support across all levels of government from UK, um, Scotland, Scottish and local would be essential to be able to fully understand and overcome these challenges. So what does that mean for Ireland and in terms of the lessons it can learn from a non-pilot so far in Scotland? Um, political buy-in, Evelyn already mentioned this, it's absolutely crucial from day one and through every single step of planning, implementing, evaluating and beyond. And we all need to be speaking the same language. I think it's, it's very easy for researchers and policymakers and, and everyone in between to be using their own lexicon. And I think we all need to have a shared language around basic income. You have to be very clear about the rationale for why you're piloting. Um, some argue we already have enough evidence, but I think a pilot can provide crucial information about how basic income can operate within your own unique political and institutional arrangements. You have to be clear about what you're piloting as well. So basic income is unique. You, you, I think everybody in the, the, the virtual room knows um, but in unconditionality and universality. But I think it's all too easy to compromise in these to make a pilot more feasible. Um, however, you have to decide at what point are you no longer piloting a basic income. Just getting to my last couple of points, Ali. Um, framing is really, really important because the framing of your pilot helps define your outcomes of interest. And that needs to be agreed up front by all partners in your collaborations. In Scotland, the starting point was poverty alleviation and it came from local government perspective. Although clearly as other partners came on board, those um, interests and in, in outcomes expanded from the public health community, from Scottish government, etc. Um, probably my final point is about communication. Um, there will be massive interest, media interest, international interest in what's happening in Ireland and clear communication with all of the communities of interest from your participants, the communities around about them, um, your local government, national government, etc. is absolutely vital. Um, the, the power of stories is really, really important and the narratives around that are incredibly important. Um, and I think it's very difficult to control everything that's said about what is, is going on in your pilot. So you have to put a lot of resource, I think, into the, the managing the communication and, and getting that right. Um, 
Finally, meanwhile, back in Scotland, um, our collaboration steering group continues to meet periodically with a focus really on disseminating our findings and exploring opportunities um, to move towards a pilot in Scotland. I think I'll just finish there. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you so much, Wendy. That is really brilliant and uh, great um, advice for all of us in Ireland who are really feeling inspired by by what you're saying and with some trepidation as well i'd say um our our third speaker now is uh jürgen de vispelera now jürgen is one of the leading academics in the basic income movement as well as having an impressive track record as basic income activist he's been a leading member of bn the basic income earth network he was a founding editor of the journal Basic Income Studies, and he's published prolifically on basic income. Now, Jürgen has established a reputation within the movement for telling us hard truths about the politics, administration, and potential effects of basic income. I'm sure today will be no exception, but it's great to have him speaking here today. So over to you, Jürgen. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks for, uh, you know, um, um... As per usual, for a very nice and hard truth speaking <laughs> introduction. Um, it's really, really great to be part of this uh, forum. Uh, I used to live for six years in, uh, in Dublin. So, you know, it's nice to be back in Ireland, so to speak, even if it's only virtually. I'm, I'm joining you from Chile, which is very, very far away, um, in case you're wondering. Um, so I'm going to, I mean, I'm, I'm actually going to talk about things that, that are really going to be quite similar to what you've heard before and actually reinforcing, but I'm meant to talk to you kind of from the Finnish experience, if you like. So I've, um, I'm not Finnish myself, I'm from Belgium, and, and actually there is a slight problem in that, um, you know, working in Finland means that the problem is that people around there tend to speak Finnish, and a lot of stuff gets published in Finnish, and that's become a bit of a problem in terms of disseminating, you know, the knowledge across the world. Um, the solution to that is to have a lot of Finnish friends and buy them a lot of beers and get direct access to the sources that way, which is partly, you know, what I'm doing. So I've been I've been talking to some Finnish people even in the last week to get some recent updates on where we are, what's happening there. Um, I was involved in some of the background when the Finnish pilot started. So the, you know, the year before the Finnish pilot itself started, there was a whole team of researchers uh, looking at Biscayne models, et cetera, et cetera. And I was involved in that. So that's kind of my connection here. Um, what I would like to do is I want to start off with two big starting points to kind of frame uh, the discussion here. Um, the first one is, I think it's really, really important to look at basic income pilots and experiments as part of the policy process to get basic income on the agenda. Why am I saying this? And many people here may think, yeah, that's obvious, but we've actually seen a lot of pushback against pilots recently. I mean, there was a lot of enthusiasm with what was happening in Finland and in the Netherlands and in Barcelona and, and in Ontario before things all went bad. And of course, in Scotland, when it initially came up, uh, a lot, a lot of enthusiasm, but especially a lot of the advocates became very, very disappointed. You know, they basically thought that all these pilots, they were not really testing basic income. It was all sort of too minimal, you know, not enough time was being spent, not enough money was being spent, etc. And a lot of people now seem to think, well, we should just skip the pilot phase and immediately, you know, why don't we just focus on getting this thing implemented? And I think it's a mistake for two reasons. The first one is, I mean, we really need to understand that these pilots are kind of the only game in town to some extent, right? I mean, you have your Irish government now proposing to pilot the basic income. If you were to go back to the government and say, look guys, this is really nice, but why don't we skip that and just go to implementation? I mean, I'm not a betting man myself, but I would put some money on the response there, right? And it's not gonna be positive. So that's one point. The second point is that we really need to appreciate that we can do all the modeling we want, we can do all the thinking we want, we can do all the designing we want on paper and you know with very sophisticated micro simulations. But it, the sort of knowledge you get from actually trying out a scheme in place 
that's just a very different ball game. And both Evelyn and, and Wendy have mentioned this as well. We need to think very, very carefully, for example, about the complexities of how basic income interacts with a host of other types of institutions and policies, whether this is income support and family policies and labor market policies and taxation and so on and so forth. And because basic income is, it looks like a simple idea, but it is really a complicated scheme, you know? So interacting with that and having that sort of knowledge is a good, good reason to pilot the scheme, to really figure out where it works, what needs to change, and then afterwards scaling it up. So that's, that's the first starting point, you know? Make sure that your experiment really is part of the policy process and think of it that way. The second thing is to think of a basic income pilot really as essentially a political event. You can't escape politics, really. You know, at the end of the day, it is often the political decision making process that starts off an experiment that puts the environment, the constraints under which you can sort of design your particular pilot. You know, what is the funding in place? What are the teams? Uh, who can be involved, you know, what sort of collaboration can you expect from civil servants and from various other stakeholders, and so on and so forth. How is this going to be implemented? I mean, there's a lot of big, hard questions on this, and a lot of this is very, very political, right? And at the end of the day, you know, you're going to have results, and these results are going to be part of a political discussion. Anyone who thinks that we're going to pilot a bis kingdom and the results are going to be black and white, and immediately sort of going to massively convince everyone that this is a great idea, they're kind of missing the point here. I mean, you know, as we've learned from Finland, even positive results going to be interpreted and going to be part of a big political game. So politics is always there. And politics is always about compromise, unfortunately. And this is something that we need to think about carefully when we design and we implement the pilot. When you think about the pilot, what are your red lines? What are the things that you don't want to compromise? And what are the things that ideally would be great to get, but you know, in the interest of being pragmatic and getting the show on the road, let's compromise on this anyway. So within that scenario, it's often not a question about should we do a pilot, but it's about trying to get the best sort of pilot off the ground, given very clearly having a view on the constraints that are in place. And we've heard stories from Evelyn, we've heard stories from Wendy, and you know, and in Finland, we've had similar issues going on, right? So what happened in Finland specifically? Well, 2015, the government, like what happened in Ireland now, the government launched that we're going to do a pilot. Very interestingly, the Finnish coalition government at the time had basically one party, that was very much in favor of peace kingdom, but had two parties that were skeptical and even hostile to it. So coalition politics immediately came into it already, right, from the very beginning. And interestingly, the two other parties that were really, really in favor turned out to be in the opposition. So that's a very interesting constellation, something to think about also in the Irish context, right? You have the coalition going on there. I imagine, you know, the Greens traditionally in favor. I'm sure that's not necessarily the case or to the same extent with Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil. Um, and then, you know, we did a year of research and then 2017, 2018, the, the project itself ran, the pilot ran. And I'm, I'm not going to go too much in the details. You can look those up, but in a nutshell, 2,000 people who were previously unemployed and getting two types of benefits that were administered by Kela. Kela is the Finnish social insurance uh, institution. So they're responsible for the rollout of, you know, types of unemployment benefits, etc. Um, so 2000 of these people were getting a basic income. It was a randomized controlled trial, which was spread around the whole country. So this was new, right? This was the first nationwide randomized controlled trial of something like a basic income. You know, that was spread out all across the country. Um, so the project ran for two years. Um, one, one of the biggest misconceptions in the media is the media went all over the place saying that the Finnish experiment was canceled prematurely. That's wrong. You know, the, I mean, the Finnish pro, uh, experiment ran as it was planned. At some point, there was a lot of calls to try and extend it, you know, extend it in time and also expand it to some other groups. And the government refused this. And to be honest, you know, I mean, this is kind of what, what normally happens, right? I mean, researchers do what researchers do. They always ask for more money and for more research. 
and governments do what governments do, and they say, no, thanks very much, we're not having this, right? So in some sense, there wasn't a big surprise there, okay? The project ran, we had two years worth of it running. 2019 preliminary results came out, and 2020, you know, in the midst of COVID, last May, the final result came out. And, you know, again, I'm not going to go too much in detail. A lot of the analysis is still ongoing, but they showed small, significant, but, but, but small employment effects, right? And one of the key things with the Finnish experiment was that the government really wanted to test the employment effects. So there, in a sense, we did see positive effects, but very small ones. Um, and, and unfortunately, you know, too small to basically convince the decision makers, the people who really thought that the key feature here is labor markets and labor market participation, they weren't particularly impressed, right? On top of that, we saw a lot of interesting effects on, you know, health, mental health, physical health, subjective well-being, trust in the government, feelings of security, and so on. A lot of things that you would imagine matters a lot, but they were kind of, you know, they were kind of tagged on, if you like. So, so politically speaking, it was all about the employment effects, which were too low to, to, you know, to basically cause much of a, um, um, a positive impression there. And then the other stuff was all very nice, but people didn't seem to be a bit more dismissive about that. So what is the reality, you know? Well, in Finland at the moment, you know, the experiment basically is not going anywhere. I mean, you know, the experiment is finished, but the results haven't filtered into the debate. There's no full-on political debate. You know, the, the, the sort of the, the debate around social security reform, which has been very active, has totally moved on and in fact is going the opposite direction. They're now more interested in looking at Denmark and introducing more conditionality and more sanctions and more activation, right? So, so that is the reality. So in one way, one might say this kingdom has, is dead in Finland for the moment, at least. You know, the whole experiment happened. It was great. It was fascinating. But, you know, we're done with it, so to speak. So what went wrong? And, you know, there are things that Finland got right. There are things that got wrong. And there's important lessons to learn. And I'm actually I'm a bit uh, scrapped for time here. I'm going to try and go very fast into some of the quick points here. Political commitment is a big issue. You know, these are some of the points that we've heard before. You know, we need to have the clear buy-in. There was political commitment in Finland because, you know, we had this sort of issue of it being launched in a government program and some funding was attached to it. 20 million worth was attached to it. It turned out that that funding was not that great. I mean, you know, so, so in some sense we had to scale down a lot of our ambitions. Experiments and piloting can be very expensive. So lesson number one here is do your homework and make sure that you ask for a lot from the beginning. Try to be very, you know, try to be ambitious if you like and try to get some commitment on that. You also need to have commitment from the political parties involved there. Again, in the Finnish context, what we had was a coalition with the prime minister being in favor, but some of the other key ministers including the finances, you know, responsible for taxation, and the Minister of Social Affairs, they were actually a lot more skeptical. So what's the problem there? You're actually dependent on multiple departments working together in order to get such an experiment on the ground. And you have a lot of resistance with a lot of the key actors there. So this is a problem. Political commitment in general, yes, but actually quite weak when you start thinking about it. So key lesson to Ireland again, Make sure you get your political commitments and your political buy-in from all the coalition partners, but also going down. I mean, think about this not just in terms of your top politicians, but think about all the people you have to collaborate with in order to make this work. You know, all types of civil servants and other groups and so on. Um, implementation structure is another key feature. And this has been mentioned by, you know, again, by Evelyn, but especially by Wendy as well. And this is really, really important. You need to think about who is going to deliver this and how can this be done? And that's always going to constrain to some extent your design. So in the Finnish case, we had Kayla, you know, they have offices everywhere, so to speak, right? Which is great. 
So, but that meant, for example, that we had to focus on this specific group of unemployed people who were getting the Kela benefits, right? So a lot of people were saying, well, it would be great if, for example, we could include artists and students and some other groups. But, you know, but that would be really, really difficult to do within this particular implementation structure. So some of these constraints can be hardwired into your institution, right? So you need to think about that. Think very carefully about the support structure and what happens there. What about the timeline? So this is another one which is really, really often put up for discussion amongst basic income advocates. In Finland, we had a two-year pilot, right? So two-year pilot, now most people say, well, two years, that's not enough. You know, by the time you figured out how to deal with your basic income, et cetera, you know, it's, the time is almost up. It takes a year to figure out how to organize your life. And then you have one more year. I mean, how would you expect someone to actually, you know, in some sense, make any meaningful changes within that? We should have a longer pilot. So here is the problem. If you think about this politically, that is really, really problematic because election cycles matter. And the example of Ontario is a great case here, right? So you start thinking about the pilot at the end of an election cycle, you have an election, the next party can basically just cancel it. So in the Finnish case, the rationale was we have an announcement at the beginning of the election cycle, right? As soon as the government is in power, we have a year to prepare it, we have two years to run it, and then have a year to evaluate it, and then there's another election cycle. So in some sense, thinking about it politically, you're probably going to have to think about this in terms of fairly short timeframes. But those are considerations. You know, I'm not saying this is what you have to do, but it's an important constraint to think about. And if you're extending the election cycle, try and find a way to hardwire this. Try and find a way to, so to speak, pre-commit the next government, whichever government that will be, into following up on this and properly you know, uh, running the project. Objectives is another key issue. Governments, I can tell you, will all want to know about employment and participation, uh, labor market participation. And many people who are in favor of this income and who are involved in debates, they basically say, look, there's so many other things that are so important to look at. You know, health and economic security, subjective well-being, trust, you name it, uh, you know, issues around gender equality and so on and so forth. So many different things to look at. But you need to, again, think about the politics here, right? So you need to find a way, in some sense, to, to, to make sure that those other considerations are also front-loaded. One of the problems in the Finnish example was that, you know, it was very much front-loaded on employment and everything else became an afterthought. No one was really working with that, was thinking about that until it got to the evaluation process. That's too late. You want to make sure that all these objectives, whatever it is you think is important, why you want to pilot, what it is you want to look at, you want to make sure that these are from the very front, uh, properly considered, built into the whole process, and everyone is signed on to this. Two final points, and I know I'm over time, but I'm going to try and very, very quickly squeeze those in. Communication has been mentioned before. It's really, really important. I mean, the Finnish experiment, the Finnish experience was, was very obvious in that sense. I mean, you know, it, it's the equivalent of when you win the lottery, like the jackpot, and suddenly you have a hundred cousins and friends who are knocking on your door from early morning to late evening, you know, and they all want to be your best friend. That's what you're going to get. The moment you start really working on this experiment, you're going to have international media banging on your door. If you don't have a communication strategy in place, if you don't have the resources in place to deal with that, journalists are not going to be stopped by that. They'll just write about it anyway. Okay. And this is where you get, you know, a huge amount of articles coming out and being shared and being copy pasted and it goes all over the place. And then you get ridiculous things such as, Finnish experiment was prematurely cancelled, you know, which is total nonsense, right? So, um, so the lesson here really is think about communication, not as something that you have to do later on. This is one of the first things you need to start thinking about. And it's not just about having a strategy. It's really about devoting the resources. This is not something that can be done by some person half time with a Twitter account, right? This has to be properly managed because you're going to have a lot of international attention. 
but also you need to make sure your communication addresses the very different stakeholder groups that are going to be interested in this and involved in this. Again, a point that's been made by other people. And I'll say one final point. If we think about an experiment, a pilot as part of the politics, as a political opportunity, think of it as a way to keep the policy window open, so to speak, then the last thing you want is to leave the experiment to just run, stay silent, be quiet about it, and let them do their work. And unfortunately, this is what happened in Finland. In Finland, the general sense was, oh, great, we have this experiment. So all the, the stakeholder groups, the advocates, were basically sitting back and saying that, OK, we'll let the team do this. We'll let the experiment run for two years. We'll wait until the evaluation comes out, and then we'll have a proper chat. Surprise, surprise, that's three, four years. Three, four years in politics, that's a lifetime. I mean, so many things have changed. In fact, by then, most of the political parties had already shifted their social security strategies, right? They came up with all sorts of plans which were totally going in a different direction. By the time the basic income results came out, the time was passed. No one was interested anymore Politics had moved on and so on and so forth. So this is where we are now in Finland, so to speak. We have these nice results and they're still being analyzed, but you know, the, the how do you say, the fertile soil is gone, if you like, right? So what's the lesson here is if you think about pilots as part of a political agenda thing here, then keep being involved, you know? So, so the, in that sense, for example, what happened in, in Scotland and in Ontario in terms of much, much more community engagement is absolutely brilliant, right? So in that sense, I think one of the biggest mistakes in Finland was exactly that, that you know the, the group who was in charge of running it quite actively actually kept everyone out. And at the same time, the groups who were you know interested in this income were actually quite happy to sit back and all in a sense of we'll pick it up when we have the results. That is too late. That is much too late. You need to really use it as an opportunity to keep the live debate going, to keep the engagement going as well. Okay. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. I'm, I'm, I'm over time. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Great. Th thank you so much, Jurgen. Um, I'm sure that everyone's heads are now bursting with issues and things to talk about and things to ask our speakers and all. I, I, can't say how much we all appreciate the three of you taking the time and energy to participate like this. And our good luck is that right towards the very end of today, um, the three of them have agreed to come back and say a few words about what has come up in the discussion and all that. So that's to look forward to. Now, we're just about to stop for, for a break into breakout rooms. But before that, um, we, we were hoping to have a, a brief input on this very recent development about the um, proposal of the uh, Arts and Culture Recovery Task Force for a basic income pilot that started with artists. Um, and I just wonder whether Karen O'Loughlin is in the room or not? No. Right, okay, um, we'll, we'll have to leave her contribution to later on. So I'm going to hand back now to Ali to take us through the next phase. And thanks again. Great, thank you, John. Um, yes, so I wasn't sure what you were going to say there, John. We're stopping for a break, for breakouts. Um, I mean, we're actually going to do both of those things. So I feel like, I mean, having heard the three speakers in turn, I mean, it's almost like a whole story and picture building up the way it flowed from one to the other and seeing the comments and reflections and questions building up in the chat. I would like, what we would like to do now is to really just to, to hold that, that energy, those insights, those questions, and to take them into small group conversations. And at the end of that period, there'll also be time for, for a break. So I was thinking that hopefully even just going to small groups, it's kind of a shift of energy. You can maybe 
give yourself a little shake now if you've been kind of sitting glued to the screen and know that you're going to go into a different kind of uh, feeling of a space and just really take what's coming up for you and, and, and share that with the people that you meet in that room. So um, if I could uh, invite you all to, to engage in that now and, and then later on after the break, we're actually going to have a whole open floor, obviously in the large group for those who would wish to speak or share. Great, thanks. Well, as, as Ali said, we invited two people to speak from an Irish background to respond to what um, Evelyn and Wendy and Jürgen said and to also, as much as I could, to some of the points coming up in the open discussion. Um, and these are Helen Johnston and Sean Ward. So our first respondent is Helen Johnston. Now, Helen's a senior policy analyst at the National Economic and Social Council, and she also chairs the Center for Cross-Border Studies. And as the former director of the late and much lamented Combat Poverty Agency, she's been interested in basic income for ages. And although we have yet to persuade her that it's the right policy, she's always entered into discussion about basic income with an open mind and good cheer. So I'm very happy that she's accepted our invitation to speak today. And it's over to you, Helen. Okay. You've just muted again, Helen, if you just unmute. Sorry. Um, okay, thanks very much uh, for the introduction, John, and thanks for the invitation to provide a response uh, to your annual conference. Um, I think I'm maybe going to provide a little bit of an alternative view, maybe one of the advantages of being on Zoom, <laughs> I can switch off afterwards. Uh, but anyway, as John has said, I've had an interest in the concept of the basic income for more than 20 years, um, but I still uh, remain to be fully convinced about it, although I think there's some aspects which are very attractive. My main concerns about an unconditional universal basic income are its ad adequacy in alleviating poverty and also its affordability. And in some ways these are counterbalanced, um, but I think that's a debate for another day. I very much welcome the commitment in the programme for government. I, I think it's only by trying out and evaluating we can see what works and what doesn't work. So I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to hear from Evelyn, Wendy and Jürgen today firsthand about the experiences in Canada, Scotland and Finland. Um, as I've read up on these as well as the other initiatives, and I do think there is a lot of learning from them. One of the learnings for me, and it's maybe different to a lot of people here today, is that rather than an unconditional universal basic income being paid to everyone, that uh, there is an income that's targeted at certain population groups and or areas. And while in some ways this contravenes an unconditional universal basic income, I think it does make it more feasible, especially in a, an evaluated pilot. Mm -hmm. And the recent proposal by the Arts and Culture Recovery Task Force to pilot a basic income with creative workers, I think is one such approach targeted a particular sector, although the details obviously would have to be worked out as part of our discussion today. Um, one of the elements of a basic income that's been promoted by the National Economic and Social Council, uh, for who I work, is the concept of a participation income. And the idea here is that work which is currently unpaid but of societal value, such as voluntary, caring or environmental work, could be recognised in some way. The pilot should be targeted at people who are not currently in the labour force, but who are making or could make a contribution to their local community or society. Ireland has um, a comparatively high proportion of households in which there is no one in paid employment. Yet there are many people in these households who are making valuable contributions within their households, within their local communities and to wider society. And this contribution, in my view, could be recognised through a participation income and provide people with an income, as well then as a potential route into education and training or into uh, the paid labour market if they so wished. At the moment, they're often debarred from those opportunities by the conditions that are required to enter current programmes and schemes, and we've heard quite a bit about that today. So if we were to go ahead with a participation uh, income pilot, this could be part of a bigger basic income pilot or could pr proceed and inform it. I, I think the way forward we, would be to select target groups or specific social welfare, island, uh, welfare areas, a geographical dimension for the pilot. Importantly, I think participation should be voluntary. 
and it would be important to involve local people and their organizations in its design and then to evaluate it with a control group if possible. And the design is obviously one of the challenges that's been highlighted by our speakers today. I think the idea that some people have put forward about having a citizens assembly uh, to, uh, to look at this would be really valuable because it combines um, experts uh, with public debate and with uh, public communications. So thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen, for, for that response. Um, our, our second speaker is Sean Ward. Um, uh, Sean's work as a, worked as a civil servant for 40 years, but he's always been the antithesis of the yes minister type. He's a person of the highest integrity and commitment to public service. And Sean's also been an advocate of basic income for as long as anyone can remember. And he's done essential work since the 1980s on costing basic income for Ireland. Sean's a long-standing and stalwart member of Basic Income Ireland, as well as a fellow cyclist, and I'm chuffed that he's here to speak today. So over to you, Sean. So if you just want to unmute Sean. Sean, do, um, if you just want to unmute, I'll ask you to unmute there. Yeah, great. Okay, Ali, is that right? Okay, okay. Um, thanks very much for the introduction, John. And I, I was uh, overwhelmed with the quality of the of the uh, of what the three speakers had to tell us. All very relevant information. Um, if I could just point out to uh, the, the the main interesting issue for me that arises in their contributions is what role, if any, can a pilot have in the introduction of universal basic income? So all of the speakers have described sophisticated experimental approaches with different groups receiving basic income and a comparable control group. Now, this type of pilot is ideal from a policy perspective. However, we should acknowledge that most policy making in the real world does not have the benefit of such a carefully structured experimental approach. This need not mean that evaluation is impossible or that evaluation doesn't happen. It often means that evaluation is more difficult and less conclusive. So we should not be too hard on ourselves if we cannot achieve a solid experimental approach in every situation. The question then arises, well, what would be essential or highly desirable in a basic income pilot? Well, one obvious thing that would be important for a universal basic income pilot is that the scheme would be universalizable or replicable throughout society. There should be clarity regarding what variables are important and what success would look like. The pilot should be monitored and tweaked as required. Monitoring and review should be inbuilt into the pilot and participants should have a voice here. I just want to look a little bit at Ireland and what does all this mean for Ireland? Well, in Ireland 20 years ago, a lot of analysis was carried out into the costs and benefits of basic income. This culminated in a government green paper on basic income, which was published in 2002. The Green Paper showed that the model of basic income that was analysed would have a significant impact on income poverty. It was projected that there could be some withdrawal of labour by married women with children. This gave rise to a discussion of values. Was it a good thing that basic income would facilitate these women to choose to spend more time with their children? Or was this a bad thing because if they chose this option, their financial independence would be reduced? It was found that the cost of the scheme would be affordable with a single combined income tax PSI rate of 48% on all personal income, excluding the basic income itself. The overall conclusion was that there could be a trade-off, some reduction in the economic growth rate, but greater equity in society. So what happened? Well, the answer is not a lot. So how do you explain this? Well, at the time, 18 years ago, there was little awareness or interest in universal basic income in civil society. Politicians in general weren't interested, and the Fianna Fáil Progressive Democrat government at the time wasn't interested either. So basic income was like a sailing boat with the sails hoisted up, but there wasn't a puff of wind or a strong current. So what is the situation in Ireland today? Well, one thing is the same. You've already heard from Sean Healy, and Social Justice Ireland continues to advocate for basic income and has updated the costs and distributional implications of basic income. But several things are different. Firstly, Basic Income in Ireland, who hosts this forum, is more active today, and I think we can all see that. 
Secondly, government consists of three political parties, including the Green Party, which is a traditional advocate for universal basic income. Thirdly, the programme for government includes a specific commitment to undertake a pilot study of basic income. Fourthly, the artistic community has experience of engaging with government in recent years to tackle the erratic and low incomes of artists and performers. Fifthly, one result of these negotiations is that there now exists a facility whereby certified artists and performers in the first year of unemployment can receive their job assist payments without having to engage in job activation. The purpose of this scheme is to allow artists to focus on their artistic work for one year. While this scheme is not the same as a basic income, it shares one important attribute of basic income, that is, suspension of the requirement for job search activity. Sixthly, this week, we had the publication of the report of the Arts and Culture Recovery Task Force, which recommended the introduction of a pilot universal basic income for artists. In my opinion, the introduction of a pilot universal basic income for artists is a really good idea. The level of the basic income payment is very important for the long-term viability of universal basic income. In the current pandemic emergency, a level of 325 euros per week as recommended by the task force may be appropriate as it lies within the range of payments which are currently available under the pandemic unemployment payment scheme. One of the strengths of basic income is that the level can easily be adjusted up or down to match economic circumstances. Thus, when the pandemic is over, the level of basic income could settle down to a viable level. So pulling all this together, 20 years ago, we had analysis, but not a puff of wind. Today, we still have some analysis, but we also have several puffs of wind. The puffs of wind come from the Programme for Government, the Green Minister for Tourism, Arts, Culture, Media, Greater Sports and Media, and I suspect there might be a puff of wind also from the artistic community. No doubt the artistic community can speak very well for itself. So just to go back to the title of the conference, how best to pilot universal basic income in Ireland as part of the programme for government? If I'm right, and there is impetus coming from the government and the artistic community, then the artistic community could be a good place in which to locate a universal basic income pilot in Ireland. Sinead, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Sean. That, that, that's a really helpful intervention. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to hand back to Ali as our mistress of ceremonies. Thanks again. Thank you, John. I, I, I love being called a mistress of ceremonies. I didn't know if I could stand by that title in this group, but I feel I'm allowed. So um, we're moving. I know a few people have had to leave and we're moving to the final moments of the forum. But we do really want to invite our dear speakers back to just make, I guess, some, it would have to be some very final words and um, uh, sorry they won't be so long but what I thought I would do is actually just invite um, each of you so I'll just bring up um, Evelyn, um, Wendy, here we are, uh, and Jürgen and maybe we'll go in our uh, familiar order um, starting with Evelyn and just yeah you're uh, we, we're going to try to aim, aim it to end at half past and then I'll have to hand over to Bobby to say some very quick fire final words, but over to you, Evelyn, uh, to kick us off just a few remarks and we'll go around to each of you in turn. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie, and I'll be very quick. I wanna thank everybody for inviting me to participate today. This has been great fun. I just wanna make one point. I've spent probably 30 years of my life generating evidence for policymakers and I've become very cynical about the process in the sense that I don't think evidence ever changes minds, no matter how good the scientific evidence it ends up convincing people that they were right all along. Whatever they believed, they're gonna to continue to believe. But I think that it does tell us one thing for the basic income movement, and that is that we need a much more sophisticated view of communications in general. How do you, how do you win hearts and minds? And the point is that different strategies of communication work for different groups of people and in different ways. And I don't have time to talk about it, so I won't talk about it, but I do think that that has to be central to what it is we do going forward recognizing that science isn't going to cut it you know gathering stories gathering narratives isn't going to cut it for everyone people are different and and the way to approach them has to be different thank you very much so just move straight on to wendy and then straight on to Jurgen. thank you Ethan. hey thanks ali 
Um, and thanks, Evelyn. Um, I, I absolutely agree with um, what Evelyn said about um, you know one one form of communication just doesn't cut it for everyone. And and yes, policymakers are a particularly tough audience. That's my day job to uh, informing around public health evidence. Um, I think there was loads of questions in the chat. I'm aware that that haven't been responded to directly, and we don't really have time to do that. But I think probably a strand through them all is about how do we do that? How do we do a pilot, and to to what purpose? You know. Some people are suggesting a, a, a national um, trial. Some people are saying, you know, a, a geographically bounded area with a saturation uh, sample within that. And others are suggesting particular groups to focus on. It's just a series of trade-offs, you know, whichever choices you make about who's involved, who's in, who's out, the learning will be different um, from each of those particular approaches. So I think it's really about deciding for Ireland what's the most important trade-offs, what's the most important things that you need to get out of your, your pilot. Broader questions about whether a pilot's a good idea or not aside, um, it does all come down to trade-offs and which is the most important for you guys. So uh, very best of luck with um, whatever comes next in Ireland and I'll be watching it very keenly. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Over to you, Jürgen. I mean, I, I mean, the you know, I was, I was really, really very impressed with the, the sort of the level of discussion. I mean, you know, if we've had this type of discussion like even five years ago, we get quite a lot of nonsense. And I mean, I've been following the chats and trying to listen to all the people, and you know, and also sort of um, I'm absorbing what Helen and Sean Ward were saying, and it's it's all been it's really been really interesting. We could talk about this for days, literally. Um, I, so, so as a final statement, let me just make one point very, very clear. I mean, I mean, I, I really liked what Sean Healy was saying about the fact that really bringing this back to politics is the point that I've been trying to make all the time as well. I mean, keep in mind that what you have at the moment is a policy window in Ireland. So the last thing, whatever else you do, do not shut that window down do not shut it closed rather yourself, right? So there are a lot of different things you can do and a lot of it very much depends on the context, right? I, I simply do not know enough about the intricacies of what's been going on inside the government. So Stephen, for example, from the Green Party was asking me whether I had any, you know, any tips for him. And it's like, well, I don't know enough about what your deal is. You know, what is the deal between Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil and, uh, and the Greens? You know, so we need to know a bit more about that, so to speak. But carefully figure out what it is you can do within the political constraints. Try and push for something that's as good as possible. But whatever else you do, do not just shut it down because it's not quite basic income or it's not quite perfect and so on and so forth, right? This is a unique opportunity. Use it to the best of your advantage, basically. Wow, thank you. So thank you for those final remarks from all three of you. And I think as we're reaching the end of our forum, uh, uh, having the privilege to be the facilitator for Basic Income Ireland for your annual forum, I'd like to say on behalf of the whole team, the organizing team of everyone here, a deep, deep thanks to Evelyn Forger, Wendy Harty, Jürgen de Vispolare for coming and absolutely enlightening us, I would say lighting us up with your insights, your experience, and you were really what contributed to have us having such a rich contribution today in exchange with all the rest of the wisdom on the ground uh, that exists here in Ireland already. So to our keynote speakers, Thank you. Thank you for being here. And um, so with this, I will um, invite our speakers to step down from the stage uh, if anyone's following my uh, uh, online room maneuvers here. And I would like to invite up uh, the final member of our uh, coordinators of our organizing team, uh, which is uh, Mr. Bobby Lambert. And I'm afraid, Bobby, there's not loads of time. And you know what the important thing you need to say as well. But I'll leave you to do that a few words to wrap up before we close. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Ali, and thanks very much to everybody who's come here. I guess that's the, that's the main thing. I think it's been an amazing um, event for learning and dialogue and exchange. Uh, and uh, thanks to Zoom for facilitating, helping us technically do this. I think possibly it's been our biggest ever event. I'm not sure we'll have to check that later, but uh, at one point I counted 125 people attending. Uh, I think we've learned a lot about the uh, piloting discussion and uh, I think some big takeaways for me were about the political project, about things like a citizens assembly, 
about the need to get grass, the grassroots involved. And I saw a comment that we had discussed before about maybe some of the opposition that we perceive is because people don't properly understand it. Um, and, um, and that's maybe talking with some of the people in Fine Gael who uh, we see as the people who are trying to stop it might be a good thing to do because it should really go with quite a lot of their values too. So um, without going through all of that, I'd, I'd just like to say that if anybody is interested in getting involved with Basic Income Ireland, we do need more people to do things. We don't need more money because we don't spend much money, but we do need more people to do things, particularly around things like the grassroots activism, engagement, getting out and talking with people. So it's very easy to find us. We've got the website, sign up there. Uh, we're easy to find. So we'd love to have more people on board to turn this from, from a pilot into a reality fairly soon. Uh, that's all from me. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Bobby. Well, I'd like to, I mean, I maybe just stay there with us both up here just to say at the end. Um, so I, I'm about to close the event as a whole, but we would like to let you know our plan for after, for those who would like. Bobby, do you want to say anything to that um, for what's happening after we end? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, normally at the end of a, a basic, uh, at a forum or indeed any basic income Ireland meeting, we'd adjourn to the pub, usually the Swan. Um, but as we can't do that now, we, uh, for those who'd like, we're, uh, we're going to have a virtual pub and you're invited to go and get the drink of your choice and reconvene in about five minutes time for an informal chat, anybody who's uh, willing to, to hang around. So that's the plan for after, but I think this is the moment to now um, to, to formally close the event. And maybe I should also just say thank you so much to our organizers, um, to Bobby and John, the coordinators, and Brad as well. You've seen active there in the chat and supporting all of us. And I know there's other members behind the scenes as well. Um, thank you for asking me to contribute. I just find it so meaningful that we to, to be able to be part of something that is so important and to show we can do it. We can work on this. We can even do it in isolated times where we're all stuck at home and we've done it brilliantly. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And with this, I declare our annual forum on Basic Income 2020 formally closed. And don't forget the pub in five minutes time.